Have you ever wondered why cooking shows seem to stand the test of time? Why does food have its own network? And how come trends like phone eats first and food corn have taken over social media? Imagine a world where one of the four requirements for survival, food, water, air, and shelter, was something we had no motivation to obtain. There'd be no life. Womp womp. Food as a source of entertainment is deeply rooted in our natural drive for this extraordinarily high value resource. We like food so much because we are neurobiologically wired to desire food, for it to grab and hold our attention and for it to make us feel good. Otherwise, we wouldn't go after it. No matter how convenient it may be, there's a reason we aren't all cozying up with a tall glass of gray, nutrient-dense, yeah. all-inclusive meal replacement sludge for every meal of the day. I have zero interest in food. If it were feasible, my diet would consist entirely of flavorless beige smoothies containing all the nutrients required by the human animal. In this video, we will be unpacking the science and history of cooking shows. If you like food or brain science, be sure to like our video and subscribe to our channel. Now, please have a seat at the table and place your napkin neatly in your lap because I'm Anya Kone, you're watching Headward, and the Headword of the week is food. Let's start with hunger. What is happening in our brains and bodies that drives us to acquire food? Sure, taste, smell, and visual appeal all play a role, but why? Why does our body want food? This process starts with a little chemical called ghrelin. Ghrelin is an orexigenic hormone, meaning that it stimulates feelings of hunger, and it's produced by the stomach. It travels from the stomach up to the hypothalamus, amongst other areas of the brain, where it tells your brain, hey, something's not right. One of ghrelin's many jobs is to alert the brain when there's changes in homeostasis, or the biological status quo. Take for example, you come down with a 102 degree fever. That's 3.4 degrees above the standard 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. This is a disruption of homeostasis. While there is a wide range of normalcy for all bodily functions because the human condition doesn't exist in a vacuum, think of homeostasis as a regulation mechanism. The body is made of a collection of systems that work together. And if one function falls, another falls, and then another, and another. It's like cascade failure. Do we see now why maintaining homeostasis is extraordinarily important? So if your stomach is empty and the lack of energy resources causes a disruption in the regulation of other systems reliant on food, that's all of them, your stomach tells your brain to tell you that your stomach needs more food by stimulating feelings of hunger. It's a bit of a chicken or the egg situation. We aren't super good at distinguishing between bodily hunger and feelings of hunger. Well, maybe with the exception of a rumbly stomach, brain fog, low energy, irritability, and low blood sugar, to name a few clues. Get in my belly! Essentially, ghrelin goes to your brain, screams, flips a table, and starts knocking things off the shelves until you give it what it wants. That being said, maybe some of us do know when the body is hungry before we experience the feelings of hunger. All of these annoying symptoms of bodily hunger are mediated by ghrelin. Your anticipatory reward pathway, made up of the ventral tegmental area that projects dopaminergic neurons into the nucleus accumbens is also stimulated by ghrelin. In simple terms, ghrelin gives you dopamine. This possibility of reward is what motivates us to go find food. The last step in the process, and likely the most satisfying, is taming ghrelin, Yum. eating. Tasting food involves a whole host of sensory neurons that gather information about the food's flavor, smell, texture, temperature, and potency, then consolidates that information to decide if it should be ingested or not. Your body has the ability to reject food if it thinks it might make you sick based on any of the information collected. This is why we have a very visceral negative reaction to certain characteristics of some food. <laughs> If the food source passes the entry exam and is consumed until you've had your fill, a set of neurons in the cortical taste area called the caudolateral orbitofrontal cortex start to diminish their activity, lessening their response to taste. You know when you're scarfing down your favorite flavor of ice cream and suddenly your stomach turns? That's the caudolateral orbitofrontal cortex saying, okay buddy, that's enough. So essentially your taste neurons work in conjunction with your stomach to decide when you should stop eating. And once you've satisfied your stomach, it is the physical expansion of the organ that signals it to stop producing ghrelin. 
And now you're free from the clutches of that demanding gremlin we call Grelin. Clearly there's something happening with food and hunger that cooking shows are tapping into. A study conducted in 2016 noted that viewing images of food increased overall widespread brain activity. Essentially, your brain lights up like a firework simply at the sight of food, even if it's not real. The group refers to this as visual hunger. That is, a suggested evolutionary response to seeing food, because seeing food likely preceded eating food. The 1937 BBC series, Cook's Night Out, hosted by French chef Marcel Boulestin, was the first ever televised cooking show and capitalized on the concept of visual hunger. Live cooking shows in theaters, such as South Korea's Nanta, combined cooking, comedy, acrobatics, and song for a lively performance. New York's Chef's Theater combines cooking, cabaret, and a meal with a wine pairing. In all of its different forms, food has been and continues to be an incredibly popular source of entertainment. And a group in 2020 found that viewing images of food also increases the amount of ghrelin released by the stomach. Not only is the brain super excitable over seeing food, the sight of food stimulates your appetite, almost as if food is stealing your focus away from everything else. Shows like these gave rise to some of the most popular cooking shows to date. Chopped, The Great British Bake Off, Hell's Kitchen, Iron Chef, Master Chef, Top Chef, Diners, Drive-Ins and Dives, Chef's Table, Good Eats, and Cooked. With your brain primed for attentional focus on food, cooking shows add an additional layer of comfort to the mix. Think of your favorite comfort TV show, whatever it may be, The Office, Parks and Rec, my personal favorite, Bob's Burgers, or maybe even True Crime. There are certain elements we're drawn to that don't necessarily have anything to do with the subject matter. If you're tuning into a comfort TV show, you've probably watched it more than once, or twice, maybe even thrice. The reason for that is the coziness of familiarity. When we're exposed to something repeatedly, we experience something called perceptual fluency. Our brain really likes engaging in familiar fictional worlds, particularly following effortful exertion because it restores the feeling of self-control. We'll call these qualities criteria for comfort. A study published in January of 2024 defined comfort as a state in which the human mind and body are at ease, experiencing alleviation of pain, grief, and suffering. Comfort is often used to communicate the enjoyment of commodities, practices, and hobbies, from cooking to fashion and modes of relaxation. There's one cooking show in particular that took the comforting feeling of TV and kicked it up a notch. Emeril Lagasse's Emeril Live really took off with male audiences in the late 90s. He strayed away from the instructional format of previous cooking shows and created a fun, outgoing atmosphere that was more widely appealing. While comfort looks different for everyone, and it isn't something we're guaranteed, it is something we seek to balance out the stressful parts of this human experience. And so it serves a very important function. Okay, now we're gonna shift gears a bit. Things are about to get a little saucy. We're diving into the sultry world of food porn. You've seen it. The hot and steamy cheese pools of a gently snapped mozzarella stick. Thick, creamy ganache oozing down the sides of a chocolate bundt cake. Or the succulent meat of a fat crab claw being dunked repeatedly in seasoned butter. Mmm, sounds good, yeah? Can you taste it? Smell it? Your mouth is watering like it's right in front of you, right? Are you... Hungry? Congratulations. You've just experienced mental simulation, the imaginary consumption of food, which is a very multi-sensory process. A 2016 study found that engaging in mental simulation increases activity in areas of the brain that process taste and reward. That is the bilateral posterior fusiform gyrus, the left lateral orbitofrontal cortex, and the left middle insula. Mental simulation goes as far as activating the primary olfactory cortex, the part of the brain that responds to smell, even if we've only read words like cinnamon and garlic. This would have come in handy for listeners of the first ever cooking show that debuted in 1924. The radio show, The Betty Crocker Cooking School of the Air, taught listeners, primarily women, how to cook meals on a tight budget, which came in especially handy during the Great Depression. Food is so powerful, so important to our survival, that a simple conceptual representation of it gets our brain firing on all cylinders. A 2019 study found two distinct reactivity patterns within a sample of subjects. 
the researchers looked at the late positive potential, the LPP, which is the amount of time neurons remain switched on after seeing a visual stimulus. They tested multiple stimuli, but the two that garnered the most significant responses were food and erotica. The name food porn makes a lot of sense. We see them in the same way. So two groups. Group A had a longer LPP to seeing images of food. Group B had a longer LPP in response to seeing erotica. Now, the fascinating part is that Group A, when presented with M&Ms after seeing images of food, ate more than twice as much as Group B under the exact same conditions. This proves two things. Our brain is wired to cue in on stimuli that supports the survival of our species, and each brain is individual and specific to each person it belongs to. This brings up an important topic. We all have our vices, whether it's food, porn, alcohol, smoking, or eating Play-Doh. How our brain develops a relationship with a vice is individual and specific to every single one of us. The brain is a powerful and tricky machine. Its only goal is to keep you alive, which it does almost too well, nearly to its own detriment. It's designed to maximize chances of survival, not to keep you happy and not to keep you healthy. This means that it learns from past mistakes and painful experiences and develops patterns of behavior to prevent the same pain from occurring in the future. That can show up as a slew of maladaptive and destructive behaviors. If you are struggling, know you are not alone. There's nothing wrong with you. We've linked some helpful mental health information for food addiction and anxiety in the comments. Here at Hedward, we love you and want you to be happy. And being happy starts with understanding that even though the brain is very powerful, it's reprogrammable. It's just a computer. For a little bit of comfort, please enjoy this beautifully crafted Studio Ghibli meal. Is your mental simulation going to work again? Or is it tickling your brain in a different way? Animated food is its own category of cuisine, designed to look especially delicious, super hot, perfectly seasoned, incredibly detailed, and so realistic-ish. Animated foods act like a bridge linking fantasy and reality. It looks like food, but it's not food. It has all the best qualities of food your brain really likes to see, but will never be food. The viewer is escaping reality and tapping into the most primal parts of being human at the exact same time. Animated food drops you into the most fundamental part of your human experience, the thing that keeps you alive, while carrying you through the vulnerable, uninhibited emotions of fantasy. It's like sensation candy for your brain. It's raw, it's visceral, it's joy, it's emotional investment, and it's reward all at once. If your brain could drool, it would. What are your theories on why animated food is so pleasing to our brains? What's your favorite animated food you've ever seen? Let us know in the comments. Food as audiovisual entertainment tickles the parts of our brain that are not unique to humans, but are fundamental to our animal experience. Without the omnipotent regulation power of ghrelin to stimulate your drive for food, or the rewarding and full-bodied multi-sensory experience of mental simulation, cooking shows wouldn't have the same hypnotic and comforting effect. Whether you like the flashy and immersive shows put on by Emeril Lagasse of Emeril Live, the calm and simplistic cooking of Ina Garden of Barefoot Contessa, or the historic and scientific storytelling done by my personal favorite, Alton Brown of Good Eats, it's a primal reaction. Cooking shows put their finger right on the button that says, under all of this cognition and complex emotion, I am an animal. Uh, I'm like an animal! That is the power, joy, and comfort of food and feelings. Thank you for joining me today as we unwrapped the science and history of food. What would you like us to talk about next? Is there a topic that's got you confused? Hedward is here to help. Drop a line in the comments. Be sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time on Hedward. I have zero interest in food.